This month, across the nation, GLBT communities are joining together in celebrations of pride to increase public awareness and to work for equality. In Texas, the 2010 State Republican Party platform proposes condemning homosexuality and criminalizing those who participate in same-sex marriages, in addition to opposing the Supreme Court decision that struck down sodomy statutes both in Texas and across the country. Where do Houstonians stand on gay right issues? What actions are being taken on both sides of the Defense of Marriage Act? And what is the current situation on the military's don't ask, don't tell policy? Tonight, gay pride, legal right or moral issue? I'm Ernie Manus and this is Houston 8. The U.S. gay rights movement started over 85 years ago, in 1924, when the Society for Human Rights is founded in Chicago. A quarter century later, the Mattachine Society is formed by Harry Hay, considered by many to be the founder of the gay rights movement. 1969's Stonewall Riots in New York are the start of the modern gay rights movement. These three days of riots transform the movement from smaller conflicts into a widespread protest for equal rights and acceptance. The following year, marches and parades spring up in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Within 10 years of Stonewall, homosexuality has been removed from the American Psychiatric Association's official list of mental disorders and is legalized in Hawaii and California. The first openly gay American is elected to public office, and Washington, D.C. hosts the nation's first gay rights march. The 90s brings Don't Ask, Don't Tell, a policy to allow gays to serve in the military, but results in the expulsion of thousands of men and women from the armed forces. In the new century, civil unions or domestic partnerships between gay couples are recognized in New Jersey and Oregon, with same-sex marriage eventually becoming legal in Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Iowa, as well as the District of Columbia. In 2003, the U.S. Supreme Court rules in Lawrence v. Texas that sodomy laws in the U.S. are unconstitutional. In 2008, New York State begins to recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states, and the California Supreme Court rules that same-sex couples have a constitutional right to marry. But in November, voters approve Proposition 8, banning gay marriage in that state. During the last year, President Obama has approved federal employee marriage benefits for same-sex couples and has called for an end to the don't ask, don't tell policy. Through battles, setbacks, and triumphs, the GLBT community continues to work for what they consider to be full equality and marriage rights. Joining us tonight are Brian Riedel, Project Coordinator and Lecturer, Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, Rice University. Cheryl Berg, Senatorial District 11 Chair, Harris County, Republican Party. And Fiona Dawson, GLBT activist and community leader. Welcome to all of you for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's start off, first of all, with there seems to be a um, dichotomy, a misunderstanding between what is jur jurisdictionally done and popularly voted done in this area. Is that safe to say? I'll start with Cheryl. Um, I would say, I would agree with that. That, that there is a dichotomy and it's it's very much and it is probably reflected somewhat in the um, as was alluded to earlier the Republican platform and is which we'll be discussing later yeah well the Republican pl platform comes across as very critical on these issues how would you respond to that Fiona um, I think certainly it does I think that um, when um, it was announced um, some of the anti-LGBT language within the platform. I think that I saw within um, uh, my friends in the community that I represent and then outside of that community as well, um, almost like a disbelief that uh, we are now in 2010. There is so much movement across the nation um, towards uh, recognition of um, same-sex relationships and recognition of the LGBT community. So for Texas... Um, to prominently come out against LGBT rights 
just seems so backward in this day and age. And I think it's, I think it's very sad because um, we see a lot of positive movement within the United States for equal rights of all people. And um, unfortunately, um, Texas um, has a very lou loud voice and is, um, you know, the largest state. And um, unfortunately, it seems like we're going backwards here in Texas. Outside of Alaska, just want to say Thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't want to forget our friends in Alaska. One, I am British. I hope that that's... <laughs> 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 Brian, <laughs> how unique is this? Historically, are we standing somewhere alone and out there, or is this pretty much a trend that's trending right now? Well, if you want to consider a historical example, think about the things that started happening in the mid-'80s when you had the AIDS crisis occurring. There were definite advances that had been made in the 70s. And then we had U.S. Supreme Court cases like Bowers versus Hardwick, which many people saw as a backlash against that progress that had been made, and also saw it in the context of fear about the gay community, especially in the 80s and the AIDS crisis. I think now the new articulation from the Republican Party of Texas is a similar reaction to the kinds of things that are going on. Anise Parker, as mayor, for example, the prominence that Proposition 8 has taken in the national conversation about what kinds of citizens, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, and transgender people are, even though bisexuals and transgender people don't often get mentioned in the conversation as explicitly as gays and lesbians. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a definite historical parallel of a backlash motivated by fear of social change. Cheryl, let's talk a little bit about what's in the platform and sure. what, what motivated it. Where sure. would you like to start? Let me explain... First of all, Ernie, that the um, the way that the platform is put together, it comes very in Texas anyway. Uh, it comes from a very grassroots, bottom-up type of process. The platform that we ended up adopting at the convention two weekends ago um, started at the precinct level. It started across the state at neighborhood levels, neighborhoods, and uh, the people in those precincts pass resolutions. They get sent up to the senatorial district. Those that pass from the senatorial district pass on up to the state. So, in other words, whatever is in this platform is from the bottom up. It's a grassroots um, effort because it all started literally at the neighborhood level across the neighborhoods of Texas. And to help people understand, this platform then, if you are a Republican elected to office in the state of Texas, then you are to uphold this or work for this to become the, the norm in the land, correct? The, um, the platform becomes a statement of, of, of beliefs, uh, of, of um, ideals, and things that Republicans, we as Republicans, promote. Um, are there things in this platform that everyone, I mean, are there things that, that people might disagree with? Absolutely. Probably every Republican if you ask them, do they agree with every single... Because you realize this is a 25-page document, and it's two-sided, well, one side here, but <laughs> it's a 25-page document, and, you know, are we going to agree with every single point of it? No, there's not going to be 100% unanimity, but this is our statement of ideals. This is what started, as I said earlier, at the grassroots level and now has made its way up to the state level and then was adopted two weekends ago. Now, it does have subcategories of family yes. values, marriage, marriage licensing, homosexuality, Texas sodomy, pornography, ethics and broadcasting. How much of this is moral information and how much are legal issues that need to be addressed, would you say? Um, I would say, you mean in, in general or in the areas yeah. that you mentioned? In both. In, in I guess general? so we understand exactly what a platform is to be used sure. for and how we understand it before we get talking. I would say um, that it's, there are many more issues and many more, if you call it, each, each of these parts is called a, a plank, part of the platform, the planks that make the platform. Each of the planks, I would say there's a majority of planks that are not related to moral issues. There are many more that are related to, for example, national sovereignty, taxation, things, um, job creation. There's a lot of things that are in this that are not in any way related to moral issues. Fiona, let me ask you this. They are a group of people, a conservative group, the Republicans, and these are what they feel are important to them. What's the problem with them articulating that? I would say that the problem is that it is making a moral judgment and I think that in the, a lot of the language that is used um, brings up God and religion and my understanding is that we should be living in a country where we have a separation of church and state and so um, bringing in this moral judgment in this way into the legal arena um, I would say that is where there would be a primary problem. I think that there's one thing to debate and argue um, 
homosexuality and and its existence and, and what makes someone homosexual. But then it's a completely another issue when you're just looking at the legal rights of all human beings. And I think that um, every American, every human being deserves to have equal rights, equal respect, and equal responsibility. And I think that by putting this moral judgment into this platform, it's saying that the uh, Republican Party, or the Texas Republican Party, um, does not, d wishes to discriminate against a group of people um, within their state. Sure, I'll go back over to you on that one. Sure. I would, um, I would respond by saying that um, discrimination is not part of what Republicans are. I don't believe we are. I, as a conservative and a Republican, don't in any way, shape, or form advocate or promote or believe in discrimination. I think that what we do is we're basing our Republican platform on the um, more than 400 years or 200 years under our Constitution of Judeo-Christian beliefs. That the United States, that America is a Judeo -Christ has a Judeo-Christian heritage and that we, that we still strive to make our Judeo-Christian heritage part of what we believe in. Um, let me jump in here. Earlier this month, it came out from the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law that they did a 20-year study following lesbian couples and their children. And their study came out saying that compared to traditionally reared teens, adolescents with lesbian parents rate significantly higher in school, academics, and total competence. And they rate significantly lower when it came to social problems, rule-breaking, and aggressive behavior than teens raised in traditional families. If, in fact, we take this study as accurate, is that in this group they discovered that, then to have a platform which says that we need to define parenting as something that's done in a traditionally male-female couple as the norm and what's best for the children, there seems to be then a dichotomy, again, between science's findings and moral and personal values. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Sure. Um, not knowing anything about the study, I would like to know longitudinally. You know, if was this taken in a snippet of time? Was there just a, a, a short window of time? What what longitudinally is found? Brian, do we know anything on that? Study? I'm not familiar with the study itself, but I think I remember you saying that it was a 20 year long study. Did yeah. I just hear that? Years they okay. followed 78 teens okay. since their lesbian mothers were planning their pregnancies and mm -hmm. concluded with these children mm -hmm. uh, today. You, have yeah, you heard on this? I, I, I have heard of the study, and um, and yes, it was a longitudinal study, and um, it demonstrated that um, lesbian mothers um, raised children um, statistically um, that, as Ernie just said, that were more well balanced, had less emotional problems, and performed better in schools. And um, more and more studies are coming out in support of um, same-sex parents. And then also we have to look at um, heterosexual couples um, that are divorced. And you have single parents raising children. Um, and I don't believe that, um, you know, that we pass that ju the same judgment on, um, on single parents as well. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't believe that there should be any judgment in that way against same-sex parents. Mm -hmm. Now, earlier on, well, we're going to move from that topic on to I want to understand a little bit about what's going on out there in the world with the Defense of Marriage Act and with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So let's start with defense of marriage. Where are we with that? And if somebody can get, I'm going to start with Brian on this. Give me a little okay. background on what is this Defense of Marriage Act. What are we talking about and what seems to be the issue? Okay, mm -hmm. there are federal DOMAs and there are state DOMAs. There are defense many, of Marriage Act, DOMA. Right, DOMA becomes the shorthand for saying it because if you say these things so often, you want a shorthand <laughs> eventually. Um, and, and there are state-level Defense of Marriage Acts, and there's a federal one. And there's a lot of debate as to why it ha happened that way. I think part of the reason was that people wanted to have a grassroots sense of what do people want, the state's rights versus federal rights. And in the end, what's made it more, I think, challenging for the nation is that we also have this concept of recognizing other states' laws, and that's made it feel to people who are opposed to it as if it's this cascading effort of, you saw the map earlier, the rainbow flag appearing in the Northeast, popping up briefly in California, only to be taken away briefly, suspended perhaps. And there's questions about how that agency happened, separation of church and state. So I think there are some questions about where the proper venue is to have the conversation about 
what we do to value relationships. Is that something that the government should regulate? Is that something that people on their own have the individual liberty, as I think many of the planks of the Republican platform might argue, to pursue on their own without government interference? I think one of the planks and one of the, the values that runs deeply through this platform is individual autonomy and the ability to decide your own life. And I find that there's a contradiction between that value and some of the articulations that have been made about critiquing the way that marriage is treated today. Mm. And I wonder if, if that's something that we could talk about. Yeah, we can. <laughs> we can talk about any of it, actually. Uh, let me just tell you that according to the platform which is in front of me, that we support legislation that makes it a felony to issue a marriage license to a same-sex couple and for any civil official to perform a marriage ceremony of such. Mm -hmm. So that's saying that this is going to be a felony if, or they believe it should be a felony mm -hmm. for same-sex marriages or for someone to perform a same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Is that a little severe? Um, severe severity, I think, uh, making it a felony as opposed to anything else is just saying it can't happen. Um, I think that uh, felony is probably a strong word. I think that the, and I, I, I didn't serve on this committee, didn't serve on the platform committee, so I can't know what their minds were thinking right. at that time when they decided that. I think that in general, uh, I would say that conservatives and Republicans, conservatives have a, the issue perhaps is making, is, is coming out because of the idea that they're trying to make a strong statement, a strong statement about the idea of marriage license to same-sex couples because of the, the notion of forced acceptance. When forced acceptance of any segment of our society, I will say, forced acceptance, I think, then has, has caused this to be in, included or added because of trying to make a strong statement to say forced acceptance isn't what we need to be doing. But then it's almost like we took the total opposite side and it's forced against it. Where, And then I go back to this with you, Fiona. It's that, but if this group feels strongly this way, don't they have every right to articulate it? Shouldn't they be able to say, you know, we believe that it's wrong. It's not our belief system. It's not how our country has operated for all so many years. This is not the way our country should define marriage. But does that mean that the LGBT community has to have forced acceptance of their opinion in this way and of heterosexual marriages? Um, again, I feel like this is a moral judgment coming into a political platform. Mm. Um, and there are many, many reasons why um, LGBT people should have marriage equality, mm -hmm. and just one of them being the 1,100 rights, federal rights that are that are not accessible to same-sex partners through marriage because they cannot get married. And so things like social security mm -hmm. and inheritance and the right to visit children, uh, visit visitations in hospitals, so on and so forth. I mean, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. And so I know there's one argument that says, well, you can just get, you know draw up paperwork with an attorney. Um, well, no legal document is going to cover all 1,100 rights that you're not granted um, because you cannot legally get married. And, and just going back to all human beings should have equal rights, equal respect, equal responsibility. And mm -hmm. so there's no reason why same-sex partners shouldn't have those same rights. Um, it's also an economic form of discrimination to make people go through contract law to get these rights yeah. because the marriage license itself is a very small fee, but the legal fees involved in drawing up these contracts, yeah. in, not inclusive as they are, are very steep. For a point of clarity, let me understand this. Does this include also civil unions or just the terminology of marriage? Do we know that? To same-sex couples? Yeah. Is it this says, coming out against civil unions? It says to same-sex couples and for any civil official to perform a marriage ceremony for such. Okay, so that would be civil unions then too. Yeah, but I would, I, I feel that, and it's surprising from the uh, Republican Party as well, because there is a very strong business case um, supporting 
um, the right to marry and, and um, same-sex relationships. And I think that corporations and businesses are leading the way because you now see that 59% of Fortune 500 companies do offer domestic partner benefits for same-sex couples because they realize that there is a great return on investment when it comes to recruiting and retaining employees and when it comes to um, actual um, selling of business and marketing to business. The LGBT community is a very powerful spending force, um, not to say all the money that would be made off all the marriages if they were made legal. But... Um, <laughs> But, and so really business is leading the way. So again, that's why it's such a shame that Texas um, Republicans are seeing it this way um, when, you know, fiscally conservative, fiscally responsible. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Fortune 500 companies recognize that LGBT, um, the LGBT community should have equal rights. If I could respond yeah, to definitely. that, Fiona, just I see, though, that we don't want to let economics drive or lead our position on issues. I, I don't want to ever think that I believe in an issue because it's economically feasible to do so. I go back to the broader picture that you alluded to earlier, that you mentioned earlier, about moral issues driving driving our politics. But moral issues come into so much of politics. Moral issues drive uh, many, many areas, whether it's um, well, just correct. many areas. Yeah. There are There are moral decisions made with almost every law that we have yep. in our country. So there is moral there is morality. It's just whose <clears throat> morality? Whose morality will will prevail in the in the making of a law. I Brian, agree with you. Let me I jump in here religion. and say Brian, mm. one of the reasons that we wanted you on the panel is you work with the next generation, not to That's age right. any of us here on the panel. Right. But those kids coming up that mm -hmm. will be the do you think that this conversation will pretty much be mute when the next generation gets here? What's the reaction you're seeing from the college kids you work with? It's mixed. Just as there's a diversity of opinion within the Republican Party about whether or not same-sex marriage or anything having to do with sexuality should be part of a party platform, just as there's debate within LGBT communities about whether marriage should be the priority above ENDA or Don't Ask, Don't Tell, job discrimination, hate crimes, for example, there's a diversity of opinion among the students. And they're very articulate because they have seen these issues debated in public in a way that other generations before us really didn't have the same privilege. And so they have a way of kind of coming to an understanding of what they feel their moral compass should be in a much more open society. And I think that we are in a great place for that. But when you look at that diversity, what's interesting about it is that the people who find themselves in favor of same-sex marriage, of repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, feel like it's inevitable. But when we look back historically, backlash does happen. And there are times when people have feared social change happening too fast and want to pull back. And that's what I hear inside of the language of the Republican platform from the state right now. This desire to recriminalize homosexuality in spite of Lawrence versus Texas, which has now become the law of the land and the basis of so many other rulings that have nothing to do with sexuality, but everything to do with personal autonomy and the control of one's own life being in one's own hands, not in the hands of the state. And I think that a lot of the younger generation take that for granted. And I, I, don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true. Just for point of order here, I do sure. want to read you what it says in the platform about Please Texas do. sodomy statutes. We oppose the legalization of sodomy. Uh, we demand that Congress exercise its authority granted by the U.S. Constitution to withhold jurisdiction from the federal courts from cases involving sodomy. Basically saying, let the state decide and ignore or uh, use their authority to determine the law of the state as opposed to the national overview. Is that a correct interpretation of it, do you think? I would think so, yes. How does that fit in, then, if the Supreme Court makes a ruling that Texas can step away from a Supreme Court judgment? I've seen this debated whether or not they do have an authority to do mm -hmm. that. Do you, mm -hmm. do you have any understanding on that? My understanding is, again, going back to the idea that this is the ideals, this is what we, we, what we affirm and we promote as a, as a party. Okay. Fiona? May I ask a question? You may ask a question. Um, does it specifically say that this, this, the, the sodomy law would apply only to homosexual relationships? It does not. So it could apply to heterosexual relationships as well. It is to the act of sodomy as opposed to homosexual behavior. Okay. So that would apply to mm -hmm. heterosexuals as well as homosexuals, as bisexual, transgendered. And it's defined differently state by state. Mm -hmm. In some states, oral sex is considered 
sodomy. In some states, anything not reproductive sex is considered sodomy. In some states, it's something else. I'm getting timed out, so real quick, before we run out of time, don't ask, don't tell. We promote that at the beginning of the show, so I want yes. to hit on it real quick. Don't ask, don't tell is Where basically... Where we, we Next, we need to go to the Senate, and then the, t the versions need to be combined and go through the House and the Senate and, pr and signed into law by President Obama. We are very confident this will happen this year. Is it inevitable that don't ask, don't tell will be overturned? In my opinion, yes. How about in your opinion? <laughs> I think that right now, I think it's going to take a long time. I know that while General, General Mullen, Admiral Mullen, the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, was concurring with the White House, all the other uh, Joint Chiefs of Staffs were, were very much opposed to, and said, wait, 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 we need to take this a slow go. Okay. Brian, I'll let you have the last 10 seconds. Anything you want to add to this conversation? This weekend is Pride. If you want to be part of it, want to learn more of it, come out and see it. Whether you're coming out personally or mm -hmm. coming out to learn, please be there. Corner of Montrose and West Time. All right. Enough of the ad. We're out of time here. Thank you all very much for Thank coming you. and discussing Thank this. You. Now, each week we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topic, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions that we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website may be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for joining us, and have a great week.